All right, let's give you a quick overview of the tools and supplies that we'll be using to perform this modification on this Trinity console today. So the glitch chip that we're going to be using is a Matrix V1. This Matrix V1, you can see, does not have a crystal oscillator populated here. Uh, with the Trinity console, we'll use the onboard clock signal, therefore we don't need one. We'll be using a JR Programmer V2. This will be what we'll use to read and write the NAND, as well as program our glitch chip. We're going to be using a fiberglass scratch pin. These fiberglass scratch pins are used to remove the top coating off of the uh, points on the console. I'm going to use a nice set of fine tweezers here and some flux paste. This is an Amtech brand flux paste. This is available on my store as well. And finally, a soldering iron. Uh, my particular soldering iron of choice is a Hacko FX8880D. Uh, however, any number of 15 to 20 watt soldering irons would work. So hang out with us and we'll go through it. Alright, so the first thing we're going to do to the console is prepare it to have its NAND red. Now the way that we do that is by soldering to the NAND points here. But before we get right into the physical hardware side, there's a few things I want to walk you through software-wise uh, as far as how to get you set up and started here. So if you take a look at my upper monitor here real quick, uh, what you can see is this is weekendmodder.com, store.weekendmodder.com. And here what you'll find is the Matrix Glitcher V1 without oscillator, which is what we said we're using. And here's the really nice nifty part. If you scroll down, it'll help you identify whether you have one or not. And then uh, we actually have a video tutorial here as well as a full-blown CR4 Muffin Trinity install guide image. Now this install guide image walks through what connection points are necessary for the chip, but it doesn't quite cover what the NAND read-write points are. That is easily done from within JRunner, but you might have the question, where do I get JRunner from? So, just to show you real quick here, if you do a Google search, Weekend Modern J Runner Download, the very first link here will bring you to a YouTube video by myself that has my J Runner package posted up in a raw mega link here. So if you just hit that mega link, you'll be brought over and you'll have a TWM J Runner package, nice big hefty 270 megabyte download because it's got all of the timing files, all of the inf reference images, multiple dashboard versions. It's a really good set to go. So you download that guy, unzip it, uh, right click run as administrator to launch your JRunner and you'll have this handy dandy image. Now I also want to point out another good little reference site here. If you were trying to figure out what your console is in, far, in terms of is it a Trinity, is it a Corona, I've recently created this decision tree and it's kind of busy um, but if you take a look it's it's pretty easy to follow through here so for this particular console it looked visually like these here a slim s series so we look at the manufacturer date on it and this one was manufactured 7 of 2011 or before which makes it almost certainly a trinity therefore we're doing the cr4 muffin now we can physically look at the console now that it's opened and validate that it's a trinity uh, but that was how we quickly can arrive to that that decision here uh, and then also on uh, weekendmodder.com, not the store, we've got a large format copy of that under this Trinity RGH page um, of that install image. So we'll be coming here to reference that image. And then finally, I just want to show you that there will be a new version of the site going live here soon. Here's a quick little preview of what it looks like. And under the guide section, there will be an RGH Trinity option, and that will bring you to the same sort of information that's presented on this page. So you can get a Matrix V1 chip. We're going to use a JR programmer, but again, you could use a Nandex programmer. And then uh, uh, video tutorial guides here. You could also use a Cool Runner Rev C if you chose to, um, and that is posted here as well. So let's go ahead and get back to the console uh, and again prepare this thing to have its NAND red. So to do that what we'll do is take this fiberglass scratch pin and we're just going to gently rub it over these points. What you should notice is that the points go from kind of a dull color to a much more shiny coppery color. And it may be hard to tell in the video here, 
but side by side closely. Um, let's see if we can get the, the image to focus there. Yeah, you can see how much how much shinier the pads on the left are. And then now take a take a quick glance and then look after I I do this. See how much shinier those points are becoming? There's actually a coating on top of these points that you're removing with this pen by doing this. And that really is gonna help the solder adhere much better. So you can see how much brighter and shinier those points are. So what do we need to solder in order to read and write our NAND? Uh, for that, we'll pop back up real quick to the JRunner software. In the images drop down here, you can go to NANDX Slim and then Trinity install. And uh, it's popped up on my lower monitor, so give me just one second as I drag the window up there. And this is the image that you'll see here. So that really closely looks just like the header that we were just rubbing with that fiberglass scratch pin. So we're just gonna color code, uh, do the wire install here. Now for this portion, I will probably uh, kind of fast forward through, uh, but again, you're just referencing that diagram exactly as it was and uh, installing these wires. So I'm hitting it with some flux paste real quick and then uh, we'll go ahead and get these spots pre-tinned and those wires installed. All right, now that we've got those pre-installed, I just want to point out real quick that the reason I install or I pretend two additional pads here and here, these two, is because those are going to be our power and ground. And if you take a look at our reference install image here, and we get that nice and zoomed in for you, you can see that we've got VCC here, which is our power and ground here. So all I did was go ahead and pretend those spots as well to be ready for VCC and ground on the chip. So I just went ahead and took care of those at the same time. So now we'll get the wires installed. All right, not the most beautiful installation, but these wires are essentially temporary. So what we're gonna do now is set up our console to go ahead and read the NAND. So what we wanna do is provide standby power to the console. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug in power to the rear of it. And then I'm gonna pull out my USB and hook up the JR programmer. Now the JR programmer does have a switch on it, and this is uh, this is kind of important here. This uh, this switch here has to be to the left in order to read and write. To the, if you look at this little section here, it says JTAG on one side and XSVF on the other. So on the left, it can interact with the the header, the JTAG header, um, which is how you read and write the NAND, or to the right. Uh, it can program glitch chips, XSVF files. So we're reading and writing the NAND, so we want that switch to position to be in the left. Uh, the other switch position down here is in the not bootloader position, so it's to the right. And then that's actually just a button, so we don't have to worry about that one. So we'll go ahead and plug in our JR programmer, for which there are drivers and instructions on my website. Go ahead and plug that into the cable here. And then there are exposed contacts on the back of this guy, so don't set it on anything metal. I like to set it on the plastic fan housing here. And uh, we'll head up back to JRunner. And what we can do is we can recognize that we've got the JR programmer driver installed because we see the logo here. Without the JR programmer logo here, you know that you do not correctly have the, lo the driver installed. You can hit this query button, and what it should tell you is a valid flash config. 
Now here's a quick test. I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to disconnect my standby power, right? My standby power is no longer plugged in. Then I'm going to go back to JRunner. And I'm going to hit that query button again. What are you going to see? Look at this, flash config, zero, 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 zero. Now this could be an indicator of bad soldering, that you're, you're not plugged in correctly, uh, as far as solder to the motherboard, but it can also be an indicator that you don't have good standby power supplied to the console. So off camera here, I'm just gonna re-plug in that standby power, and I'm gonna recheck my query button. And look, I got a good flash config again, and I see Trinity here. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit read NAND, and uh, this thing's going to speed through two NAND reads because that's what I have selected. And uh, while it's doing that, we'll go ahead and fast forward. All right, so as we're approaching the uh, final section here, what I want to in in demonstrate is that what we don't see here any indication of bad blocks that would be still considered normal had it happened. If you see error reading block XXX, whatever the, the, the number is here, as long as it repeats from the first read, which I'm highlighting here, to the second read, and then finally indicates some sort of success remapping, and then you ultimately end up with this all important NANs are the same message. As long as you see that at the end, then you have successfully read the NAND. Uh, you have a NAND dump 1 and a NAND dump 2 file. If you hit your show working folder here, what you will be presented with ultimately is a uh, folder which contains those actual files. Those are your original retail files and they are uh, definitely worth saving. So at this point, now we could just disconnect the JRunner and um, continue on here. But as a little bit of a cheat, maybe call it a little bit of a pro tip, you are also safe to go ahead and write your ECC file at this point. Now the one thing I'm going to caveat for you is that if you write the ECC file at this point, just be aware that the console will not boot normally uh, once the ECC file is written to it. You would need to rewrite this nandump1.bin to it to, to be able to resume booting normal retail. So just so that's noted here. So we're doing a glitch 2, which is what the Muffin CR4 is based on, and then we do use CR4 speedup, so we want to select that. We're going to hit Create ECC, uh, which then generates this image da -da 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 ECC file, and we're going to write ECC. And this will actually go by really fast, so we won't bother to skip, uh, uh, to skip past this because uh, it only has to write the first 50 blocks. The ECC file contains that Zell application, which is what will allow us to capture our CPU key, uh, and it's very tiny here. So now we've successfully written our ECC file. By default, the console or the application reloads the NAND dump 1 and NAND dump 2. Um, and again, just to note, the console will not boot right now uh, because it does not have a glitch chip installed and it has had the ECC file. So in order for it to successfully boot uh, Zell now, we need to install the glitch chip. So we'll go ahead and disconnect our JR programmer. We'll disconnect power from our console. And we're actually gonna slide that to the side for a second because what I wanna do now is actually use the JR programmer and while we have this uh, easy access to the pins, go ahead and program the timing file that we're going to use to the glitch chip. Now I mentioned before this switch that the JR programmer needs to be in to the left in order to read and write NANDs or to the right in order to, um, and I'm, I'm holding it upside down again, uh, to the left in order to read and write NANDs and to the right to do XSVF functionality. So I like to switch that with the uh, JR programmer unplugged. So I'll unplug it briefly. I'll move that position to the right and then I'm going to re-plug it in. And then the cable that comes with the JR programmer for this purpose looks like so. Uh, I include a little bitty bit of pin header with the purchase here so that you can shove that in the end and uh, be able to insert that easily into the glitch chip to make connection so you don't have to cut the end of these wires off and solder them to your chip or anything. You can actually just do it handy dandy like so. 
So uh, this plug only fits in one of the slots, so plug it in where it fits. Uh, go ahead and line up VCC to VCC. You know, they're, they're all labeled here. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. So we'll go ahead and do that. And then I'm just applying ever so gentle pressure uh, in this direction with my finger in order to force contact across all the pins here. And then we'll pop up into J Runner. Uh, we're going to click this advanced and then custom NAND CR functions. It looks like uh, my window capture isn't grabbing that. So let me uh, go out to the main window here. So I hit again, I hit advanced. Advanced custom NAND CR functions, which pops up this little window. We're going to go to the XSVF functionality, which is the say, to say the flash glitch chip functionality. Um, we're going to click on the little device. Right now, I've got Corona muffin file selected. We're actually going to do Trinity uh, muffin file, and we do the 7-1 file. Now, if you're looking for this, uh, the page that we had open before. Store from here, and then we'll go to Xbox Tools. We'll hit the matrix without the oscillator, and then just so that everybody knows, you can find it. Here's the download file pack for the muffin timings. You can go ahead and download them right there. Um, so if you don't already have those timing files, this is the muffin 71 Trinity, and then all you got to do is click this Run button, um, and then so we get a device not found. So that's telling me it's not happy about the JR programmer's condition. I'm just going to play with the switch, move it back and forth, unplug it and replug it in real quickly. And then uh, I'm going to re-click this run button. There we go. So Zillinex device not detected. I think it's maybe not making great connection. There we go. Sending out packets, that's what we should see. So it sends out through here. Um, on the chip, the light lights up. We get a success message here. I'm going to show you what that looks like on the uh, on the chip itself and do it one more time. So here's me holding the cable. The blue light is lit up, and then I'm going to go ahead and click the uh, program button on the. And we get a little bit of blinking going on. And ultimately, we get this nice, happy success getting out of j -Runner. So there it goes. Our glitch chip is now successfully programmed. Uh, we've written our ECC file, so we're actually going to be done with the JR programmer until the very final step. Uh, we, we use it to read the NAND. We wrote the ECC file. We've programmed our glitch chip. So now what we need to do is actually install the glitch chip. So... What you can do here is uh, take a piece of electrical tape and kind of curl it around if you want. There is some exposed copper here, so I would be careful not to let that ground off on some points on the board here. Um, what I have, because I do a whole bunch of this, is a roll of double-sided foam tape. So I just cut off a healthy little section of that and stick that to the back of this guy and peel that guy off. And see, this gives it a little bit of height too, raises it off of the board some for me. And when I install this one, I generally put him right here, just above the south bridge, kind of between the points for power and ground, and then through this hole where we're going to route a couple of uh, cables as well. Um, the reference images for what we're going to install here are back to that uh, big nice guide that we have. So if you look at the uh, store page this is on there or weekendmodder.com it's here but if you look we've got each one of these pads that we're going to use labeled so the first thing you notice is there's a little bridge that needs to be made here and then we actually only use a b c and e d and f are left unpopulated you also notice that in this particular chip that i, I built this image around there is an oscillator on board we do not need that oscillator and then actually if if we did have the oscillator present just to throw this out there you could still use that chip but what you would want to do is this zero ohm bridge that's in place right here between D and E, you would want to remove this resistor, which would disconnect power from the oscillator. 
thereby allowing you to use the onboard clock signal, which is what we're going to do because we have no oscillator. And that's actually preferred and, and what is gives the better boot times here. So um, referencing this image, I'm going to go ahead and pre-tin the pads that I'm going to use and make that bridge. So getting in close here a little bit, I'm going to go ahead and build up some solder on this side, build up some solder on this side, and then a quick little movement kind of connects the two. All right, VCC is our power, so we're going to want a pad of solder there. G and D is obviously ground. We're going to do A, which is going to be our RST signal. We're going to do B, which is going to be our post signal. We're going to do C, which is the clock signal. And then finally, we're going to do E, which goes to that DB2G3 point. So those are the pads that we're going to use. D and F can be left untinned uh, because we will not make use of those pads. So um, the first ones that I like to wire up are just power and ground, real nice and easy. So ground is this guy here. So view here. Ground is this guy here. So you can see, I'll just melt that pad, insert my wire. Now yes, I realize I'm using a red wire for ground. Uh, the color of the wire does not matter. I just happen to have a lot of this wire. So uh, use whatever kind of wire you want here. Uh, you don't want to go too crazy thin on the power and ground wires. Um, I mean, Kynar might be acceptable uh, technically, uh, but just be cautious. Uh, if, if you're going to make the choice, you've only got a few thick wires, use them on power and ground. Alright, so this one is our 3 volt 3 pad, aka our VCC power. And this is uh, a little longer than we need, so I'm just going to kind of line it up, trim it out strip some off the end here and we have successfully installed two of our wires all right so now a the next point that we're going to use is our RST signal and RST is the reset clock signal and what we can do with this is we can per our reference image uh, go right up to this little bitty resistor and go to the top side of it right there however uh, let me point out to you if you take a peek at the RST signal here um, what I have highlighted on the image is actually running the RST signal just to the underside of the board right by the X clamp and using this FT4R2 point. And this is going to provide, in my opinion, uh, very, very similar boot times, if not exactly the same, and be a much safer spot for most beginners to solder to. Now, if you feel like tackling that side of the resistor, you've got some experience with old ACE installs, uh, by all means, you're, you're welcome to use it. Uh, but this is going to be the recommended point that I'm going to suggest that everybody use. So again, A, R, S, T, right? It's on the flip side of the motherboard. You can see where it's zoomed in around here by the X clamp. And at that zoom in, you can see the point here. And then right over near that is actually our post point, which we'll hook up to uh, around the same time. So first thing I'm going to do is just connect one end of my wire to the A pad. And then we're gonna remove the console from its case. So I'm gonna have to pull out that front ring of light board. Flip this guy over after I tuck this wire through the hole here. All right, so I'm just kinda pulling that through. And you can see the point right here see if we can get some uh, there we go some nice video camera footage so you can see the point FT 
for R2 just here. Uh, you can see my wire is plenty long enough, so what I'm going to do is actually snip it off just a bit long. And then I'll pre tin that end and hit that spot with a little bit of flux paste, just a tiny amount. While I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and come over to this side and hit our post point with a little bit of flux paste and get these couple of wires installed. Alright, now that I've got both those wires installed, we don't actually have the uh, the C, the post wire, excuse me, B, the post wire, uh, attached to anything here. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and apply a little bit of hot glue back away from the point, uh, but on the wires. And the reason for that is, if we accidentally tug a little too hard on these wires from the top side, I would rather be tugging against a little pile of hot glue rather than accidentally rip the... Uh, points off of the motherboard and do some real damage here. So we ran the wire to A already. That post point is going to go to B here. So let's go ahead and trim that guy. Notice I do a lot of rotating of the motherboard while I'm working on this. It's all about getting the best angle. So feel free to do the same with your own install. There's no reason to be rigid about where you leave it. Do it. what allows you the best access to your point. Alright, so C is our point where we go to the onboard clock signal. And this wire we're going to need one to be a little bit longer because we're actually going to route it a bit of a different direction here. So instead of routing towards this hole, what I'm going to do is I'm going to route over here towards this guy. So I've got a wire with a little bit of length on it, and I'm going to go ahead and tack that down to pad C. And then we'll pop this guy through the hole right next to the south bridge right here. And then I'm just going to reach up underneath the board and pull her through. And then we'll flip the board over. This will be the final point that we need to uh, actually install underneath the console. And what you can see here is the point that we're going to. And uh, let's show you the reference image again. Uh, so here is our standby click point down here. It's uh, over away from the X clamp, opposite side. You can see I did the same thing here, popped out that south bridge hole. And then nice and zoomed in, you can see that's FT3. So, uh, comparing that to what we're working on here, you can see FT3 in 2 just there that I'm laying my wire over. So, we'll go ahead and trim this guy a little bit long, just a teensy bit. Strip a little bit of wire off the end of here. And then we will pre tin that guy a tiny bit. So, just getting a little bit of solder on there. We will hit that spot with some flex paste. Get a little bit of solder built up on it if possible. Just get it nice and ready. Then we'll just hold the wire right over it and tack her down. There we go, beauty, beauty. All right clean up our little puddle of flex paste and same story with the hot glue back from the point just a little bit I like to put a little bit of a little bit of hot glue on there again in case it gets tugged on would much rather have that strength of the hot glue reinforcing things 
All right, and then the last wire, we're literally at the last wire already, can you believe it? Is actually gonna route from point E to the DG or DB2G3 point all the way down here. So let's show you that reference image here as well. So reference image points that out on the top side up here. You can see run from the chip down to the front of the motherboard. And then that expands out over here. So you can see uh, DB2G3 is our point. So on the console itself, what we're looking at there is from here, right? From E all the way down all the way down to this guy right here. DB2G3, just in front of that capacitor on the front edge there. So we're gonna need a wire long enough to stretch that distance from the console up there. And that's one that I often have to uh, trim off of a uh, an uncut bundle of wire because I don't have all that many long pieces of wire laying around. All right, so we got a nice little piece of wire there. We'll trim it up. Let me just give you guys a little better view. Trim a little off each end. On this side, it's pretty simple. We're going this direction with it, so we'll just hit that point, insert our wire into it, and while we got it sitting here, and you guys have the camera view, we'll go ahead and pre-tin that stranded wire end, just so it's got some solder already stuck on it. Then we will get down here to our point, same story like always, throw a little flex paste on it. Hit it with a little bit of solder. Get it ready. Lay our connecting wire right on top. And just tack it down. Easy peasy. Clean off some of our flex paste goo. Hit her with a little hot glue. No problemo. Now technically, we are done with the installation. The console has all of the necessary wires installed to the glitch chip. Uh, it has the ECC file written to it. So what we're gonna be able to do now is go ahead and reinsert it into the housing. We'll go ahead and reinsert that bring a light board at the front and uh, what we can do is plug in power plug in our HDMI and because I'm lazy uh, we'll take a H or a, a Ethernet cable that runs back to my router plug that in too that's gonna allow us to pull in the CPU key over the uh, IP address rather than needing to uh, manually type it out anything like that so uh, we are set to actually go ahead and attempt to glitch this thing. I'm gonna use my little infrared remote, press power. We should see some pulsing, and then hopefully we'll get a happy little boot symbol, which we do, that's great. And uh, we should actually see Zell on screen here. There we go. So Zell boots up, you see this network init, a network initialize. It's getting an IP address from my network. And then down here at the bottom, it's going to display to us our CPU key. So we could manually just write that down and paste it in JRunner. Or, because I'm lazy, uh, what we'll do is go up to my web browser. We'll go 192.168.1. Uh, and what was that IP? 173 in this case. 173. Three. And by hitting that in, what we did is we brought up this page hosted by the console, actually. We can grab that CPU key and we can real easily just copy and paste. So we get to not have to type in the whole thing. So we've successfully, CPU key is correct, that's great. 
We can see the KV info, we can see the serial number and the DVD key now decrypted. We're going to make sure Glitch 2 is still selected, CR4 is still selected, and uh, we can go ahead and hit this Create XE Build Image. Now pay attention to this question. If you get this pop-up, you always, always, always want to say yes to this, right? You do want to delete that file since you manually didn't put it there. Now we're going to get a whole bunch of output of text in here as it's creating our UPD flash.bin. This is our final image. This is the modded NAND. It also loads it up here in the UPD flash.bin. Now back to the console. What we'll do is power the thing off, first of all. We can go ahead and disconnect power briefly. Disconnect that H or that uh, Ethernet connection. Definitely don't want to accidentally leave that on. And then uh, we are at the stage that I mentioned before. We're going to need the JR programmer one last time. Now make sure that you've got it flipped back from XSVF mode into uh, JTAG mode so that it can interact with the SPI JTAG header. Um, Go ahead and plug that guy in. Plug in the header into the uh, where we soldered it in before to read and write the NAND. And reconnect our standby power. And what we can do now, or our last step, will be to pop into uh, JRunner and hit our write NAND button. That's going to write this UPD flash.bin file, which will take about as long as it took for each of the original reads. So we'll skip through that as well.